Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Purdue Pharma began selling OxyContin, a Schedule II extended release preparation of oxycodone, in 1996. OxyContin was aggressively marketed, resulting in an increase in sales from just under $50 million in 1996 to more than a $1 billion in 2000. Now, drug-related overdose deaths have skyrocketed in the last two decades, exceeding 100,000 people in 2021. More than 70% of these deaths are tied to opioid use. What is the relationship between early marketing of OxyContin and these later trends in opioid-related harm? That's the topic of today's episode of A Health Policy. I'm here with Julia Dennett, a postdoctoral associate at the Yale School of Public Health. Drs. Dennett and Greg Gonsalves published a paper in the August 2023 issue of Health Affairs examining the long-term effects of early OxyContin marketing. They found that states where there were higher levels of OxyContin marketing in 1996 experienced higher rates of adverse long-term outcomes, including hepatitis infections and deaths. We'll discuss these findings in today's episode. Dr. Dennett, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I'm happy to have you as my guest today. This is such an important topic. It's one, of course, that we've all heard something about, but uh, your paper extends our knowledge in important ways. Uh, I gave a very, very quick uh, introduction at the start of the show, but could you just say a little more, since you've studied this more than I have, Tell us a little bit about the opioid crisis in the United States and a little bit about the timeline, because the timeline is really critical to understanding the work that you've done here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So as you uh, described, the United States has been devastated by an ongoing opioid epidemic over the last few decades. Um, And so over half of a million Americans have died since 1999 from opioid-related drug overdoses. And uh, this epidemic is typically separated into three separate phases, uh, characterized by what drug specifically is driving um, the majority of overdose deaths. So first, beginning in the 1990s, um, there was an increase in prescription opioid overdose deaths. And so this prescription opioid phase lasted until 2010, um, when heroin overdose deaths began to increase. Uh, Finally, beginning in 2013, there was a dramatic increase in synthetic opioid overdose deaths, um, particularly illicit fentanyl. And um, as you uh, mentioned, um, so in recent years, around 70 to 80 percent of opioid-related overdose deaths are actually due to uh, a synthetic opioid like fentanyl. And um, in more recent years, there have also been substantial increases in uh, polysubstance overdose deaths. And so what that means is, uh, for example, fentanyl in combination with cocaine or fentanyl in combination with methamphetamines. It's also important to know that in addition to overdose deaths, uh, the opioid crisis involves other adverse health outcomes. Um, So due to injection drug use with non-sterile syringes, there have been substantial increases in infections like infective endocarditis, uh, which is a bacterial infection of the heart, and infectious diseases like uh, hepatitis C virus infections and HIV. Public health experts have also referred to this as a converging public health crisis. So this is a crisis that's played out over many years, and as you mentioned, it has different phases. It's always hard to uh, know where to start. Why do you look at the marketing of OxyContin as a critical point in trying to understand how this epidemic unfolded? Yeah, so we were interested um, in looking at the factors that helped explain the trajectory of the opioid crisis, Um, and it appears that the marketing of OxyContin was an important contributor to that. Um, So as you you previously uh, mentioned, OxyContin was introduced in 1996 by Purdue Pharma, um, and it was developed in response to their morphine-based drug MS Cotton uh, becoming generic. And so MS Cotton was uh, primarily used to treat pain in patients with cancer. And around this time, providers generally prescribed opioids to treat pain in cancer patients um, or acute pain after surgery, for example. Uh, And they were reluctant to otherwise prescribe opioids uh, due to the risks of addiction. 
Purdue was interested in expanding this market uh, beyond cancer pain, and so they marketed the drug as a treatment for moderate and chronic pain, uh, which, which represented a much larger pool of patients. And so uh, they aggressively marketed OxyContin as an effective and safe treatment for these more common types of pain, um, and they infamously downplayed the risks of addiction. Uh, they organized conferences, offered large sales bonuses, um, and importantly, they used detailed marketing data to identify and target their efforts towards leading opioid prescribers. Uh, these efforts were very effective. Uh, other companies similarly followed suit with competing opioids. And so um, as a result of all of this, uh, we and others see that OxyContin marketing was an important factor that shaped the trajectory of the opioid epidemic. Uh, earlier studies and our work have shown that areas with greater exposure to OxyContin marketing from the mid-1990s uh, experienced larger increases in opioid shipments and opioid-related related overdose deaths compared to other areas. So what you're describing here is a drug that had a fairly narrow profile, dramatically expanding, and what you're saying is that the dramatic expansion was the intentional effect of marketing choices and behaviors by the manufacturer here. Yes. Much of your study looks at this question of what are the long-term effects of what you call exposure to OxyContin marketing. So that's not a term that rolls off the tongue. Can you just say what you mean when you say exposure to marketing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so broadly, uh, when we say exposure to OxyContin marketing, uh, we're using an epidemiological definition, uh, meaning it's the variable that potentially explains or predicts um, an outcome. Uh, so for example, we could similarly say that exposure to asbestos causes mesothelioma. Uh, in this study specifically, so we categorized states into high, middle, and low levels of exposure to OxyContin marketing at the time of its 1996 introduction. Um, unfortunately, actual marketing data from Purdue Pharma wasn't available, uh, so we employed a proxy measure. And if we say that a given U.S. state had high levels of exposure to OxyContin marketing, uh, what we're saying is that the state or prescribers within that state were more heavily targeted by OxyContin marketing compared to other states. Okay, so this is basically, it's not so much the patient necessarily being exposed to it, because this is a prescribed drug, but there's just more activity by the manufacturer here to try to convince uh, uh, doctors that this is a safe drug to be used for broader indications than cancer. Exactly. Okay, so let's jump to the findings. What did you find overall regarding the relationship between these levels of exposure to the early marketing and these later health outcomes that you've described? Yeah, so we found that states that had high levels of exposure to OxyContin marketing, um, which was defined back in the mid-1990s, saw increases in multiple adverse health outcomes, uh, particularly viral and bacterial complications of injection drug use, uh, which was uh, new findings for this literature. We also saw increases in some illicit opioid overdose deaths associated with injection drug use. And it's important to highlight that these uh, we're seeing these findings 25 years after OxyContin was introduced. And so it's, it's alarming to find that pharmaceutical marketing decisions from decades ago have had these uh, major drastic consequences for something some seemingly unrelated, like the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, but that's exactly what our study is seeing. Um, so specifically to add some additional details um, on our methods, so all of our data was obtained from the CDC, um, and we looked at differences in these outcomes across states with high versus low exposure to initial OxyContin marketing. Um, importantly, we looked at these differences before and after the year 2010. Uh, so this marked, as I mentioned, the start of the heroin phase of the opioid epidemic, uh, but it's also when OxyContin underwent a chemical reformulation that made the drug more difficult to misuse. And a body of research had linked this reformulation to uh, increasing illicit overdose deaths and the spread of infectious disease. And we find that before 2010, trends in our outcomes were gen generally similar, regardless of the level of exposure to OxyContin market marketing. After 2010, however, uh, we see significant divergences in states with high levels of exposure uh, versus states with low levels of exposure. And these outcomes specifically, we see uh, significant divergences in, in fatal synthetic overdose deaths, which is mostly driven by fentanyl, uh, rates of acute hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, and infective endocarditis-related deaths. 
And although they weren't statistically significant, we also found suggestive evidence uh, that Oxycontin marketing may have increased heroin overdose deaths and HIV diagnosis related to injection drug use. We found similar results after we accounted for um, st some state-level policy changes that occurred that may have been um, associated with initial Oxycontin marketing and outcomes. So these include things like marijuana laws, naloxone access, access laws, and prescription drug monitoring programs. And we also tested some other potential hypotheses that could explain our findings. Um, and these include uh, poverty rates, pre-existing drug use, chronic pain, uh, chron other chronic health conditions, and unemployment from the Great Recession. And we find that they actually do a relatively poor job job of explaining our results. And so what all this points to um, is that Oxycontin marketing decisions from decades ago have had these lingering adverse consequences to the present day. Well, that's a pretty powerful finding, and I want to both understand it a little better and try to think about what the implications are uh, and talk about those with you. We'll cover some of those topics after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Julia Dennett about the relationship between early OxyContin marketing and later adverse uh, effects associated with opioid use. Um, before the break, you gave us sort of the overall findings, which are pretty powerful. And I want to just sort of understand or make sure I understand the way you think of this playing out. And I realize that the study itself doesn't prove these things, but I'm just trying to get my head around what the dynamic model is for something that you're looking at 25 years later. So what I'm understanding is that the, the marketing, even when you control for all these other factors, which I think are ones that we would have thought are pretty related with deaths, you mentioned uh, characteristics of, of people in the States. But when you go back to the marketing, it sort of sounds like it unleashes this ecosystem of behavior of people using the prescription drug, and then you hit this wall where uh, misuse and diversion becomes much harder. And so you have people who presumably are dependent or addicted, and they shift to other sources. And that's why you mention these different phases, and they go move to heroin, and they move to the, uh, to the synthetics. And of course, the consequences of, of, being, of using the prescription drug are bad enough, but then when you move into illicit drug use, you have infection risks and the synthetics, you have much higher death rates. So is so is that I mean, that's again, I'm not the expert here, but I'm just sort of trying to understand, like how we think about how something that happened so long ago could still be playing out today. Is that a way a reasonable way to capture it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's basically the um, story that we've seen unfold in the data. OK, so. Let's go back to the beginning. You mentioned different levels of exposure to marketing, but if they're trying to build use of the drugs, why didn't they just go everywhere? Or, I mean, what what is the difference between a state where there was little exposure and a state where there's a lot of exposure? Yeah, this is a great question, um, and it uh, it lets us kind of dig into the variable, the proxy variable we're actually using for exposure to mid-1990s Oxycontin marketing. Um, so the main reason why we're seeing uh, variation in these marketing levels across states is actually due to specific strategies um, that Purdue Pharma was using to market these opioids. Um, and so we build on two um, really great uh, previous studies that looked at Purdue's internal marketing documents um, that were disclosed as part of court materials. And in these uh, materials, they actually identified very specific marketing strategies that explain this variation in marketing levels um, and uh, ultimately found that increased exposure to these, to these strategies uh, increased long-term overdose outcomes. Um, and so the first of these strategies was identified by Professor Abby Alpert and colleagues. Um, and they found that Purdue was uh, reluctant to market Oxycontin in five states that had a triplicate prescribing program. And so what this was, um, so basically required that prescriptions be written on an official form. And uh, one copy was kept by the prescriber, one by the pharmacy, and another went to the state. Um, and so basically, um, they had to keep these copies for documentation. Uh, it increased the paperwork and regulatory burden uh, for physicians. And then uh, this shrunk the potential market for Oxycontin. 
The second marketing strategy uh, was discovered by professors Carolina Arteaga and Victoria Barone, and they found that Purdue initially promoted OxyContin uh, to oncologists and primary care physicians that were treating patients with cancer, um, and that they hoped to use these physicians actually as a conduit or a bridge uh, to reach patients with chronic or moderate pain. Um, and so as a result, uh, states with a uh, higher cancer burden would have been more heavily targeted by OxyContin marketing. Um, and so what we do is that we combine this information on state triplicate prescribing programs and state cancer burdens, and we use that to construct our initial uh, OxyContin marketing variable. So states with a higher cancer burden and, uh, not, and no triplicate prescribing program would have been more exposed than a state with low cancer burden and a triplicate prescribing program in place. Now, we've published quite a few papers in health affairs on prescription drug monitoring programs, so we certainly are aware from our own, uh, the, our own publication that uh, these kinds of barriers to misuse uh, do have demonstrated effects on prescribing patterns. Um, but just uh, you have to, of course, thought about this, but, you know, if the states that have those characteristics are really fundamentally different from other states, you could find differences in long-term effects that aren't because of those policies, but because of other characteristics. So are, are the states with the triplicate and with the uh, higher or, or lower cancer rates, are they kind of distributed around the country and kind of like all other states? Or are they like, was this a movement that happened in one place? Yeah. So um, we found that uh uh, so we looked at some characteristics across the states that had a high level of exposure versus states that had a low level of exposure. Um, and we found that the populations of states with high levels of exposure uh, were older than the populations of states uh, with low levels of exposure, and that these populations were also disproportionately uh, non-Hispanic, white, and native-born. And so this observation is consistent with um, looking at a state with an older age distribution. Um, those states are going to have high, a higher cancer burden for that reason. And so because this is a key input to our proxy for OxyContin marketing, uh, we didn't think this was super surprising. Um, in terms of other characteristics, though, uh, we find that um, populations of both high and low exposure states uh, were generally similar in terms of shares of people that were non-Hispanic black, uh, similar education levels, similar, po similar poverty levels, and um, our outcomes of interest before this uh, 2010 OxyContin reformulation uh, were, very, were similar. Okay, so the, um, good reason to believe then that you're actually finding an effect here. So we're a policy journal, and of course, uh, the cancer rates are not uh, directly uh, responsive to policy, but the triplicate prescribing is. Uh, but that's now going back, you know, uh, a couple of decades. When you think about... Um, the policy implications, I guess there are two dimensions I'd like to ask you about each of them. One is we now have a lot of opioid settlement money uh, out there to be used to address the crisis. And so my first question to you is, when you think about allocating resources to respond to the crisis, do your findings or your findings in conjunction with other work, do they have any implications that uh, we should be thinking about? Yeah, so our results uh, point to several policy actions that can be taken um, to try to address some of these long-term consequences um, from long-ago OxyContin marketing. Uh, so uh, our findings first kind of highlight the need to consider uh, infections and the spread of infectious diseases associated with injection drug use uh, when we're determining how to address the opioid epidemic, what policy steps we can take to combat the crisis, and how to allocate opioid litigation settlement funds. Um, these are things that should be taken in mind, considering that they are also long-term consequences of, uh, of initial OxyContin uh, marketing. Uh, policymakers can specifically provide aid to communities um, that have continued to be devastated by the opioid epidemic. Um, they can expand access to treatment for opioid use disorder, and they can improve the availability of harm reduction ser uh, services. Uh, for example, things like syringe service programs, uh, which can reduce infections and the spread of infectious disease. Um, in addition, policymakers uh, can also take steps to improve the regulation of pharmaceutical marketing um, and prevent future public health crises. Uh, we don't dig into this in detail in our, in our study, but um, the recent Stanford Lancet Commission on the North American Opioid Crisis uh, lays out some specific recommendations. So this includes, uh, uh, they suggest limiting uh, the influence of the pharmaceutical industry on prescribers through either advertising bans or eliminating advertising costs as an income tax deduction. 
Um, and they also suggest some specific steps to modify the pharmaceutical industry's relationship with regulators. Uh, so I'm glad you reminded me in uh, the first part of your answer about the, the broader burden than death. We focus so heavily, appropriately, of course, on the tremendous number of people who've died from this crisis. But uh, broadening out the sense of the harms and the ability to potentially intervene to address those harms um, seems like a, a, a really important goal. So I'm very glad you focused our attention there. Uh, you then mentioned, and that was sort of going to be the second area I was looking at, is policies with respect to marketing. Uh, and you talked about advertising, which is a, a you know, we, we know we treat uh, drug advertising very differently in the United States than in other countries. Um, I am curious, though, and again, maybe this is beyond your scope, but this whole notion of sort of uh, harnessing uh, clinicians as uh, the lead voice to market to their colleagues. And uh, you mentioned sort of, you know, finding the oncologists and the primary care docs who are prescribing for cancer and using them as a voice to, to start thinking there are other people who you could prescribe to. Is there any thing we can apply from there to other circumstances when it comes to prescription drugs that ought to raise some concerns among the policy community? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I don't think I have, I don't think I necessarily have an answer for that. Um, I think we can look at the uh, opioid epidemic and its origins as a case study as to what went wrong, where there were regulatory failures. Um, and so uh, we can use that as kind of a guidepost to see how we should be thinking about this and how we should be, um, how we should be ensuring both safety and efficacy uh, while also making sure people have access to the, uh, the drugs that they need to be healthy. Well, that sounds right to me. And um, it unfortunately is a case study that we're still living through and living with the effects of. But um, these... Uh, kinds of crises have a long time horizon and um, we'll continue to learn and hopefully adjust along the way to uh, you in, to integrate what we've learned into our policy response. So Dr. Dennett, thank you so much for uh, conducting this research and for helping us understand the really long tail of policy decisions that happened decades ago. And thank you for being my guest today on A Health Policy. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about the health policy.